Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially with this uh, audience uh, of so many people uh, from around the world who have made the most uh, significant contributions to our uh, uh, built uh, environment. It's just a pleasure to be, be with you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, David, and thank you for all the fine work you've been doing uh, with the uh, Council of Tall Buildings and Urban uh, Habitat. Uh, David uh, said um, he was going to be really serious about the time. Uh, we had to stick to it, okay? So, uh, uh, David, just in case I don't respond to the bell, okay, uh, I brought my own cane and you, you're free to use it to get me off the stage. <laughs> Thanks to my knee injury. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, uh, to talk about the, uh, uh, the spire. I was asked to... Uh, talk about the uh, technical things that were learned from the design of the, um, uh, the spire, the structural design of, of the spire. And it was a real pleasure working on this uh, project and I just want to recognize the uh, working with the developer Garrett Kelleher from uh, Shelbourne and the uh, architect and engineer uh, Santiago Calatrava and coordinating so closely right here in Chicago with the uh, architect of uh, Reckett, Perkins, and Will, and we had the pleasure of being the uh, structural engineer uh, uh, of, uh, of Reckett. Uh, get this thing going. So anyway, let's, let's talk a little bit about the spire. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, 2,000 feet tall, a little over uh, uh, 600 uh, meters, uh, and it's circular twisting and tapering uh, geometry uh, was very successful in uh, reducing accelerations uh, and wind loads. And I think this is very important with all of the buildings out there that have different types of geometries. It shows the true uh, integration of engineering uh, and, uh, and architecture uh, to give you a most efficient uh, uh, building. Yet with the spire, we wound up with a very straightforward uh, uh, structural system with the columns coming down almost perfectly straight, even though we had this uh, 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 twisting. But before we go further, I'd like to put the design within the context of a little history or evolution, as uh, this uh, conference is, uh, is called. And uh, there's been a quest for the most... Uh, 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 efficient structural geometries by engineers and architects for uh, many, many uh, uh, years. Uh, Gaudi was trying to make uh, spires that uh, would not have the uh, horizontal spread problem that domes uh, uh, had many uh, years ago uh, in developing uh, some of his designs as shown here. But what he also accomplished here, probably not knowing it, uh, with the combination of the taper and the combination of uh, uh, the circular design and the roughness of, design, of the design, it was an excellent design to uh, uh, minimize wind loads and uh, uh, wind accelerations. Although, uh, obviously, not all that critical on a uh, structure of, uh, of this, uh, this height. And then as we got into the 70s and 80s, uh, the council... Uh, was doing an excellent job in trying to classify structural systems as to what, which ones would be the most efficient for uh, different types of, uh, of high rises uh, relative to, uh, uh, to their uh, uh, height. Um, and the emphasis then was on steel, because uh, there was this philosophy then that, oh, go really high, you needed steel. Um, but a lot of this applies to uh, concrete also. And as we learned as we went forward that concrete uh, had uh, more and more advantages uh, in, in high-rise construction because it's additional mass, it's uh, additional damping, and the fact that as we got higher strength concrete, the stiffness went up uh, also. So it became a, a great competitor uh, to, the, to the steel. But what the council was emphasizing uh, at that time for, um, they promised this would work as a pointer, see? All right, so I'm an engineer and I have my own pointer. So they, <laughs> the emphasis was on the, uh, uh, the tube structure for going very high 
okay, which had the advantage of uh, utilizing all of the outside columns to resist the lateral loads and minimizing um, uh, much of the uh, uh, bracing and sometimes eliminating it in the core, making the uh, mechanical electrical engineers and the owner uh, ver very happy. Uh, but it had very close column spacing on the outside. Now, if you notice here, uh, they, uh, they showed the uh, typical, you know, core with an outrigger, you know, for buildings in the 50-story uh, uh, range. And the advantage of, the, uh, uh, of uh, this design uh, was that although we had bracing uh, in the core, uh, you had much larger spacing on the outside of the uh, building. But one other little disadvantage is the, con the, um, uh, uh, the outriggers had to go through and cause additional bracing inside of the, um, uh, inside of the uh, uh, core. So keep keeping that uh, in, in mind as we go forward, uh, we'll see what really happened. Uh, we started to realize with a variety of structures that the outrigger system could be used for very tall um, uh, systems. But as I said, the emphasis then was on the, the tube, and uh, a typical example of a, a tube structure here, uh, which actually comes from the World Trade Center uh, study, and it shows how uh, for wind load in any direction, you activate all the columns to resist the wind load, and that's where you get the efficiency, and you also get a very high redundancy, uh, as was shown by the uh, excellent performance of the, of the tube during the very tragic uh, situation of 9-11. Uh, uh, then Chicago went one step uh, uh, further with the uh, uh, bundle tube. Uh, all of this was being... Uh, developed at the time, uh, and the tube was basically invented by Fazl Khan from uh, uh, SOM. So the bundle tube got us uh, even higher, but still we had uh, uh, close, uh, close column spacing uh, to concern ourselves with. Um, but before, actually before the, uh, the uh, bundle tube, the John Hancock uh, uh, Center uh, solved the problem of the close column sp spacing by giving us uh, di diagonals on the outside, a, a diagonalized tube, which uh, was uh, very, uh, very efficient. Um, uh, as a sidebar, I'd just like to mention, when, when this building was uh, studied, and you look at all the papers that came uh, out uh, uh, on this building from, uh, uh, I think it was Hal uh, Enger from, uh, NCON from uh, SOM, you realize that these diagonals were not only helping with the lateral forces, but they were also helping bring, bring down the uh, vertical forces. So in many ways, this was kind of the, uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, diogrid, exoskeleton type of uh, project that we're uh, seeing. And I just add that as a, as a sidebar, actually. Uh, then we started to use concrete uh, more and more as shown in the uh, Kuala Lumpur project. And here, taking advantage of its mass, its damping, extra stiffness when you went to high strength, uh, we were able to use a uh, concrete core and then a framed core. But because of the concrete's massiveness in this frame with a relatively large column spacing, you are able to get a certain amount, a significant amount of tube type uh, action working together with, with the core. So concrete started to has really come into its own and it's been used in many other places in Chicago and uh, obviously in uh, Houston and, and places like that. But, you know, steel was still uh, competing and the next tallest building after this was 101 Taipei, which was all steel. Uh, but, you know, concrete wasn't gonna let the steel get away with that. And now our, uh, uh, the tallest building in the world is interesting uh, to note, uh, Burj Dubai is uh, essentially all, all concrete uh, uh, building. Um, 